You've tuned in to the heart to heart. Heart to heart. It's You're now tuned in. What, what are you tuned in to? Right, I've got it. I've got it. You've tuned in to the Art to Heart podcast with myself, Andy and Mouse, diving into behind the scenes of a creative mind from the highs to the lows and the trials and tribulations that they face on a day-to-day basis. So sit back, enjoy as the episode's about to begin. But please note, there is explicit content within. How are you, Amy? Doing good, thanks. Thanks for having me. So as no, you no, it's tell, a pleasure. As you can tell, we're 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 not speaking to someone from the UK today. So, for where, whereabouts are you from? From anyone listening? I'm from Worcester, Mass. Or I'm about forty five minutes away from Boston, Mass. Kind of smack dab in the middle of Massachusetts in the US. Cool, cool, cool. Right, cool. So, I would like to kind of open the show. Is kind of like throw some uncomfortable questions at you, just to get you kind of relaxed. So you, in a sense, you've kind of got through the worst, so to speak. So, are you ready to answer some uncomfortable questions? Give it to me. Right. Okay. Oh, you seem up for it. Here we go. Right. So we'll start off nice and easy. Biggest fear? Um, sharks. Sharks. Okay. Cool. Do you sniff your own farts? Sorry, say that in, in a different... <laughs> do you sniff your own farts? Or do you hold your breath? No, I don't... Why would I hold my breath? The other, yeah, no. I don't hold my breath. <laughs> <What? laughs> right, cool. so, so she sniffs her farts. Everybody does. I guess so. Um, your, biggest, your biggest pet hate. Like, what's the biggest thing that annoys you? Um... Lack of empathy. Understand cool. That. Understand that. Next one. Weirdest place you've ever done it. Oh, she's thinking. I've been with one person for 30 years, so. Mm. I guess on the washing machine. Right, uh, fair uh, play. Utilities can't be beaten. <laughs> and last one, secret celebrity crush. A secret? Everyone knows the main one. Um, Snoop Dogg. Ooh, fair. All right, okay. Something about him. <laughs> right, fair enough. So cool. Snoop Dogg, if you ever listen to this... <laughs> There you go. There you go. Um, right, so that's it. It's done. Yeah, call. Um, <laughs> so that's it. It's done. That that that's the round over and done with. Um, so yeah, we, we're going to dive straight into it. Really. So um, you were born and raised in Massachusetts, mm-hmm. um, and where where did all like the art start? Like you know, um, I had down here that. Um, you kind of used it as an anchor, like a hostile home environment. Yeah, um, I was always an anxious, shy child. And when I was six years old, I was at a restaurant called Friendly's. It was ice cream hamburger place, and they had a coloring contest. And I did the coloring contest, and I won. And the prize was you get to go and make your own Sunday behind the behind the um, counter. And I was just like, well, maybe I'm good at this. And this was at six years old. Um, the arts yeah. aren't, were pushed more than they are now. You know, I got to like go out of my classroom um, a couple times a week and go to like a, a museum and learn how to do pottery and photography. And um, it was a great opportunity. So it just kind of like, it was something that I felt like I was kind of good at. And being who I am and kind of my complexes, I I wanted to excel in something so that I could like get some attention from my parents. So I just kind of like stuck with the art and went to college for art and photography and kind of took off from there. 
So you right. kind of oh. touched on it there, but um, you said that you used art as a kind of method to get some attention from your parents. Do you mind yeah. sort of diving a little into that? Um, I have two sisters, so it was three girls, and two of them, besides me, were very difficult children. So here I am, the middle child, which I don't know if it's really because I was the middle child or just because I was the easy one. I didn't get a lot of the attention. Mm. I felt loved, but I didn't get the attention because my sisters were always in some kind of trouble. So Mm. I could have probably gone two ways, acted out to get the attention or tried to overachieve to get the attention. And I went the overachieving way. Like I had to get all A's and B's and do the best just to try and get that I'm proud of you, which I don't know, boomer parents weren't very good at it. At least mine weren't. Um, Mm. So I never really heard that. Like it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I actually came to terms with that. Mm. Um, I didn't know how powerful those words really were. Even Mm. being a parent, like I, did that for my kids. Like, I think I overcompensated. I built them up. I told them how adorable they were, attractive they were as later, you know, teenagers and tried to like really build their self-esteem because I think as parents, that's what we should do. And I just didn't get that. Yeah. Yeah. So like moving on to, like you mentioned the college and you went to college to do art and photography, Yeah. but you kind of felt like, were it the photography that you fell out of love with? Yeah, well, I loved the dark room. I loved the challenge of actually using a manual camera with film. I'm 46 years old, so I'm kind of dating myself here. Um, so I was using a manual camera with film in the dark room, and it really took some actual talent. I'm not saying that digital photography isn't a talent, but to get that great shot and then. Yeah, yeah go into the dark room and actually develop your film and print your images. That's what I loved about photography. So when photography started getting into the digital world and now like Sally down the street who happens to just have like a nice digital camera can now make these images that are kind of outshining what I can do in the dark room. I was like, this isn't for me. I'm going to step away from photography. And I just walked away from it and never looked back. I used to do weddings. I used to do prom pictures. I used to like really market myself for photography, but I absolutely fell out of love with it. I'm not a digital person. I need to feel things. I need to see like, even with my drawing, like, I don't think I'll ever go into the digital world. It's just not for me and probably because I'm 46 years old, but <laughs> no. So after, after your college walked away, then you continued to do kind of your drawing and everything like that. Like, did you have the shop? Cause you're on Etsy at the minute, aren't you? You've got the Etsy shop set up and stuff. Did you have anything kind of established at that point? Or, um, you know, I was doing the whole mom work, you know, family thing but I always kept art in the background. There would be times where I'd have like difficulties and wouldn't draw for maybe a year even sometimes. But when I would pick it up again, I'd bring it into work and I'd be drawing at my lunch. And some of you would go, oh, can you draw a wedding present for me? Can you um, draw, you know, my parents who've passed away? And so I kind of turned into a portrait artist with a strong focus on family members who passed away. Like I started getting, can you combine this photo with this photo? Because my father never met my child because he passed away. So I would combine two photos and that's kind of where my art took off from there. Just doing gifts for pe- for people, um, family portraits really. So, so how long ago was cool. that when that, that sort of started taking off? Um, probably... 2003 maybe was when I really started focusing on um portraiture pencil mostly and for, for anyone that hasn't seen Amy Amy's pencil drawings are stunning that that Nipsey hustle one I've, I've, I've never managed to get over it's fantastic there's some right there <laughs> but um that yeah, Nipsey is good. actually marker so um oh, and that unreal. that's brand new for me marker is like my new found love 
it's it's stunning. I've, I, can't, I just can't say They it. are class. Uh, anyone that hasn't seen it needs to go and find it. Thank you. So, um, obviously, you know, the main emphasis of why we're doing this is kind of diving into people's backgrounds um, and obviously highlighting the struggles that they've faced to then kind of build it back up towards the end of the podcast where the the kind of almost hitting a good place in the success. So if you don't mind me bringing up, like you mentioned, 2019 were kind of, was that like the start of like a dark pathway for you? That was the, you know, they say everyone hits rock bottom and yeah. my rock bottom isn't the same as anyone else's rock bottom. It's just the lowest I've ever been. Um, and yeah, like 2019, like literally changed my life. Um, I was in a very, very good opportunity job wise, but I was working 70 hours a week. Wasn't seeing my wow. family. I wasn't drawing. I wasn't going to the beach. I wasn't doing, even though I'm scared of sharks, the beach is my favorite place, oddly enough. Hmm. Um, and I completely lost who I was in the the goal to make that money. I was I was offered an opportunity to um, you know have ownership, part ownership of a company without coming wow. out of pocket wow. at all. I mean, this is the level of overachieving that that I have gotten to where I even I didn't finish college. I don't have any degrees, but I did such a good job that this company was like, we need you. We want they headhunted me. They got me there. And four years into that job, they're offering me part ownership. It could have been amazing money for my family. And I think about that every day. I do. But I don't think I'd be here today if I continued on that road. So I can't even like, I, I can't think about it. I, you know, I would love to have, you know, a place at the ocean, a summer home, but it just was not worth losing myself over. And my kids would have lost their mom. My husband would have lost their wife. Like, his wife and it just wasn't worth it well so so during that during that period then it did get that low where obviously just just this circle that you were in of, of work and everything like that and, and not being able to kind of control things did yeah. it get to that point of obviously it, it did think, um right i wished that First, it started off with me sleeping as much as possible. Like I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. the only time I could not think about how sad I was. And, and it's weird because if people looking into my life would never have known this. I have a house. I have two beautiful children. I, I don't have the trauma that I grew up with. Like I have a wonderful life. Mm. But what was going on in my head wasn't wonderful. So I was first sleeping as much as possible, sometimes 24 hours. Like I was missing a lot of work. It was when, when you feel like your family is relying on you and you just feel like there's not a way out. Like if I stepped away from this job, what is that going to mean for my family? Like it was just, I, and I know people say, Oh, it's just a job. But when you're used to a certain lifestyle, you're getting these $10,000 bonuses every couple months, like your family, are we stuck? Oh, you glitched for a minute. No, it's fine. Sorry. Um, you just feel stuck. And I felt like I just had to get through it. But I woke up, it was September. It was actually Suicide Awareness Day, um, September yeah. 9th, 2019. And I had a plan to kind of run my car off the road and, and my life. Like I just, I, I was like, this is a way out. Maybe they'll think it's an accident and there won't be any, I just was like, this is, this is my way out. Before that, I was, I was always like, let me hope I get into a car accident so I don't have to go into work. Like it was always kind of a, a inner thought for me. But thankfully, instead of doing that, I drove myself to a hospital and I asked wow. for help and I got admitted and I, um, inpatient 
psychiatric is not a good place to be for a woman, first of all, with the addiction people that are there. It's not a great place to get better. It's just a place to kind of save yourself from yourself. Almost start the ball rolling, and yeah, in, they in. they kind of just make sure that you're safe so that you can um, get the help that you need. And while this was happening, um, my grandfather, who I is my only grandparent that I love, was dying of um, heart problems. So I'm I'm in the hospital writing a eulogy because my plan was when I get out of this hospital, I'm going to speak at his funeral. Um, so I literally wrote his eulogy in this inpatient facility with people going nuts. I'm trying to like come to terms with like, I just admitted to my whole family that I have a problem um, mm -hmm. in the biggest way possible. Like I didn't, you know, seek therapy. I, there's so many more avenues in the way that I went about things, but hindsight's 50, 50, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I spent only three days inpatient because my grandfather's funeral was on the fourth day. Um, and I got to speak at his funeral. And then I admitted myself into like an outpatient intensive outpatient um, program. And that's where I kind of learned some of the tools that really has helped me like deal with some of my trauma, deal with, um, just why it got to such a dark place. The the overachieving, yeah, yeah. the overachieving had to end. I had to set boundaries for myself. I had to find myself, do what I love, wear pink hair, get a septum. Like this all happened from 2019. Like if you could see a picture of me prior to 2019, I don't look the same. I look probably 10 years older than I do right now. Um, it's it's so hard to think back of. To, to who I was before that happened. So I'm not yeah, yeah. glad that it happened because I wouldn't be in the place that I am today. And I like where I am today. I really do. Can I just ask yeah, a bit of an yeah. off the cuff question? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, just very, I've had some employment issues with, with companies before and I ended up quitting my job. How did you, how did your employer deal with the yeah. what what happened and you taking yourself off um right i knew myself well enough that i knew i couldn't go back there because i would just get stuck in the same even if they promised me that they wouldn't have me working so many hours or what i i know the relationship i had with the owners I, I know I would have probably gone back to the same place. So I said, I, I appreciate so much what you had offered me. Um, I learned a lot, but I, I can't come back. And I was actually unemployed for a while and then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So it was very hard to find a job during COVID. But they were like, you know, if you ever want to come back, we'll take you on any kind of level. They were really nice about it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't. I knew I couldn't go back there. Yeah, that, that's wow. what I always find that it's quite a challenge, especially in a workplace. Mental health could be quite a challenging thing to sort of speak about, really. And um, Yeah, I wasn't worried about the judgment so much, like, because I don't know that I would have opened up exactly what went on with me. I would have just probably told them I needed some help um, getting it um, back. You know, I wouldn't have probably gotten into it with them, but... I knew for myself I couldn't go back. No, that's. Uh, I, th I think that's an important thing to kind of put out there is that if you do feel in that kind of place that you, you're trapped and that there is a way out, there is always a yeah. way out of this. And thing. your life isn't your job. Like, you know, you hear all the time that employers will appreciate you the next day if you pass away. So why are you going to kill yourself for an employer? And it's kind of true. Um, of course, I miss the money. Like that's the only thing I miss. But yeah, wow. <laughs> right. Well, let's let's move on to a more positive note. And thanks very much for obviously kind of going as deep into it as what you did. Um, I, I was breaking a tear at one point. I must have. <laughs> I thought, oh, hold hold it together, hold it together. But um, no, thanks for that. So let's move on to your artwork now. So obviously, you've got some 
behind you now. So your artwork is obviously quite heavily sexually referenced with nudity. So, so where's that kind of come from? Because you've done, like you, you say, your portraits of famous people like Snoop Dogg. Mm. Let's throw, throw him back in there again. Um, but then there is this kind of nudity with the skeleton. Mm-hmm. So can you explain that to us? Um, it kind of happened because I, I kind of said, fuck it. Like I am, I got a lot of, it started with, sorry, let's go back. 20, uh, sorry. Yeah. 2020s Inktober. I did a few pieces. I had never picked up a marker before or a pen and I, a few of the words just kind of like, oh, I could do a little something spicy here. And I did, and it got well received. This was on my old IG account um, that got banned and deleted. Um, And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I started to hear some negativity from my mom, my aunts, you know, because I would share some of it on Facebook. But I kind of was like, whatever, I'm, I'm not going to pay any mind. And I did a little bit of, um, you know, BDSM rope work after that in yeah. pencil. And boy, did I get judged for that. <laughs> um, you know, my mom actually called me and she's like, what exactly are you into? And I'm just like, first of all, none of your business. Second of all, just because yeah. I draw something, that's a lot of assumptions are made that because I draw something, it, does it look beautiful to me? Yes. I don't think I would draw something that I don't think is beautiful or interesting or intriguing, but does it mean that I was doing that on Saturday? Not necessarily, maybe sometimes, Mm. but, um, (laughs) so I, I got a lot of judgment and I, Inktober 2021, I decided to do all risky. Like I tried to every what 31 days in October I tried to take the word that October um gave me and do something risky just something that I thought was beautiful that pertained to that that word and I loved what I came up with um but again it was met with a lot of I got I I G didn't like it obviously they um no they they are so hard on artists especially now like it's gotten worse this was 20 21 but I think things are 10 times worse in 2022 but um mm-hmm. so Inktober is really where it started with me and having done those pieces I got hit up by a local um art gallery and said they're doing an erotic art show um for Valentine's Day and I was like oh that's great oh cool and I, went to the drawing board and I did some pieces and had the art show and had such an amazing experience, met some like-minded people that were just not the judgmental people, not the people that look at art and go, well, you know, you're into some, some shit like, um, and, and so that, and I had had two previous art shows before that, just some local things that people like let me hang my work up and it was so well received. And then COVID hit and it totally took my momentum away and I didn't know what to do from, from that point. I was like, I want to continue with this erotic artwork. Um, but where is it going to lead me? I can't always post it on Instagram. Where else can I go with this to, so people can see it? Like I can draw it and put it in my portfolio, but in this day and age, who wants to do that? You want people to see your work. <laughs> you want the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, Was this still on the first account then? So you still had your yeah. original account at this yep. point? Yeah, but I, yeah. Was, I was trying to post things. Actually, before, it, like I was kind of, flying flying under the radar for a while like I was posting I wasn't getting any slack I was getting followers positive feedback and then I think I pissed a conservative off you know with the whole Trump election here and all right yeah yeah I I sometimes have a big mouth so I think I pissed a conservative off or I didn't respond to a guy's DM you know they can get a little touchy 
um, if I don't respond to a DM and they literally mass reported my stuff, um, I, 11 pieces were taken down. Um, wow. I, you know, submit appeals. I lost some appeals. I won some appeals. And then uh, in February, I just went to log in and my account was gone. I tried to, and at that point I had what, 3000 followers, almost four. Um, and I tried appealing it, but I never heard back from Instagram on my appeal. It was just gone. I think what people don't really realize is that sort of as an artist, your, your Instagram's kind of, especially in this day and age, it's kind of your business. In, and it really it, is. For me, especially, it's my portfolio. Yeah. And the thought of it getting deleted is really scary. I was devastated, like mad at the world, like angry because I was, I had seen so much, not worse, but more in your face than what I was doing. And I just didn't understand why. Like I felt very attacked and it felt very personal and I learned something from it. I was like, well, you can't piss people off on the internet. Um, cause literally their voice will be louder than yours when you try and do an appeal. Um, it, it was devastating. Yeah. I can imagine. Uh, so w once your accounts got taken down, then you decided to kind of reaccount it for the second time. Um, and obviously start publishing these drawings again, right. which did you have any backlash from that? Did you, so your second account, did they try to take them down again or did you, how did it work? Shockingly, like I was, I was good. I was putting little emojis over certain areas. I was like really trying to censor myself initially because I was like, I'm not going to go through this again. But then I got to a point where, you know, I had, I found some great people on my second account, you know, making a new account where I was actually getting more feedback, even though I only had 400 followers, I felt like I found people that were actually interacting other artists. Like it, it was actually a better experience having the 400 followers than the previous 4,000. Um, yeah. And so I was like, you know what, I can do this again. If I, if I lose it, I can do it again. So I did a, I don't know if you remember the drawing I did of um, a woman with a ball gag in her mouth. There was, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. there was no nudity, nope. but she did have quite an expression and like tear running down her face and drool. And I loved it. Like I literally came across this image online and I was like, I'm going to make it my own. It, it didn't end up looking like the image at all. Um, and it, somebody shared it for me like in their story and that night so i said a thank you and i reshared their story to my story and i got yeah. flagged and it said your story has been removed and then like 10 minutes later that image was reported and then i think i had the skeleton with with the buttocks and that was even blurred out and then that got removed and I tried to appeal and I lost the appeal and I was just like, here we go again. Like I don't, it's not even nudity. So I, I decided to kind of research in a sense, like what was going on because there's a whole community on Instagram that is able to post whatever yeah. they want. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. It starts with an O and it ends with an F and it's because they make money for Instagram. I don't know the deal with OnlyFans and Instagram, but they tend to get away with so much more than artists. Yeah. And I found photos that were exact, almost exact images of what my drawing was with the ball gag. And I was like, I'm going to do a test. I don't want to censor somebody. That's I don't go around reporting people. That's not my thing at all. But as an artist, I wanted to know what is IG's requirements because they say nudity is okay on Instagram as long yeah, as yeah, yeah. a painting or a sculpture. So I reported some ball gag photos and it quick, not quickly, it came back as not a violation to community standards. So oh. why, why on earth 
is a drawing of a woman with a ball gag a violation, but a photograph is not. This is a yeah, yeah. So once she kind of did this experiment then, um, and kind of went towards people's other account with the photos, etc., and then realized that they didn't get taken down. Like, how how did you feel? Angry. Like I'm I'm really someone who believes in like equality. If I if IG has standards, yeah. then I feel like everyone should have to meet those standards. Uh, and so when what what was different about someone reporting my drawing as when I reported the photo? It's the exact same scenario with a different outcome. And and mm. I just I, I'm a logical person. And it doesn't make any sense to me. So where's the logic? Exactly, yeah. No. So kind of moving it forward to, to now then. So you're going through all this worry about your second account. Is it going to get taken down again? You know, and, and, and all the rest of it with the censorship. So you've got that every day of kind of questioning whether to post it and, and batting through your mind. But then you've kind of gone with it. And then we've all faced now as artists, which it pisses me right off, is the real thing where I love my static posts, but we're all being forced into this kind of real where you've kind of embraced that. You're posting all your reels and everything. Um, then all of a sudden, from I think what what we got around 500 followers or something? I had Were it around that? Or I had almost 800. So you were on about 800 followers, then all of a sudden, you've just banged a reel up. Tell us about it. And this I, is happening right now. Yeah, I don't love that I have to do reels. Let's let's get that clear. Like I, Instagram was a perfect format for photographs. Like it's it's just how it was built and what it was made for. But I understand during the pandemic, people wanted entertainment at their fingertips and they kind of went to TikTok and literally had hours of entertainment free at their fingertips, no matter where they were. So I think obviously IG, I think was losing a lot of um, people to TikTok where they had to kind of change their format in a way and and I don't like that I have to do reels it feels it doesn't feel very natural to me and a friend of mine Jose Roland um he's a verified person on both TikTok and Instagram and he gave me the best mm. piece of advice he's like you got to go with the times and the viral sounds is everything like he went viral because he was using the trending sounds or music that was on TikTok and that happened to work for him on Instagram as well. So his piece of advice is even if the music isn't something that you like, if it's, unless you want to stay true to, to who you are and don't want to be a yeah, cool yeah. sellout um, to kind of market yourself, you kind of have to pay attention to trends on Instagram, go through reels on your own, find something that you're seeing kind of quite a bit look at that sound and then check to see how many people have used it. And that's what I did. So I started making reels with that in, in the back of my mind and not just, you know, I use the templates that they offer too. Like I literally yeah. use the templates, the sound and apply my art. And I did one about a week ago. It, it maybe got, 1200 views so i was like okay it did okay you know for having 800 followers 1200 is not bad then i was sitting at work and i happened to look at my phone and all of a sudden i have 80 likes and i'm like what is going on and the reel from a week ago got caught in the middle east and i could tell that because it was a lot of Arabic, a lot of um, Mohammeds. Like you can just tell by the names. Yeah. Sorry, my screen kind of just got smaller. Um, I said. So I was like, wow, like I'm going 
kind of not viral at that point, but like somebody's paying attention to me. I'm either on the popular page or I'm in their reels or I don't know what's going on, but I was like, okay, like this, this could turn into something. I didn't think much of it. I went to bed and I woke up and I had 40 DMs and I was like, wow. what is going on? And they weren't all great DMs. Um, <laughs> being a woman artist, when you do risky topics, your DMs can be pretty con- Ugh. Yeah, yeah. You were not the wrong kind. Yeah. Um, but then I was getting, you know, my views went from, I don't know, 20,000 to 30,000 in 10 minutes. And it was just like, what is going on? Like, I'm so confused. And it was mostly I ran in the beginning and they're going through a lot of issues. So I was getting dms about like save our country you know speak do you know speak for us help us and i was just like i'm just a little artist in the u.s like i would love to help you guys and i do plan on doing some pieces for those people because i'm empathetic and and what's going on there isn't right um so i plan on that once my commission is done um because i want to pay it back to the people who obviously made my account blow up Mm. um and last I looked before this call, it was at 857,000 views. Ninety um, wow, 890,000 when I looked. So it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's done a bit more again. <laughs> yeah, almost every time I look. So you're on, it, you're actually like, on 921 now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you're gonna hit 921. <laughs> How what many followers the? did I have? <laughs> <laughs> You've got 2,755. I had about 2,500 before this call, so. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's (laughs) mind-blowing. That's nuts. Absolute nuts. Just off one reel from from you posting several, that one reel is like we were talking about this the other day, weren't we, Mouse? How that, that that one post can just snap and that's it. Away you go. Yeah. And it's impacted my other reels that are around it because those people that are looking at my account go, well, what else is she doing? Um, So some posts that had like 900 views is now over 20,000. So it's just, it's been a lot. I'm trying to look at the good and not the bad. Like the DMs are are very overwhelming and I am kind of a sensitive person to that. So when I get a religious zealot in my dms telling me i'm going to hell i'm like oh god okay block but okay try not to focus on that but it's hard not to because i'm just not a person i would never give somebody any negative feedback Uh, ever i would just skip it like i i i only try and lift people up and um so when somebody either attacks my character or or my beliefs, or my art, or my looks, like, it just, it's hard not to let it affect you. Personally, I always yeah, find yeah. the best way to look at it is yeah. if, if they've taken the time out of their day to send you a message, be it good or bad, if they've taken the time out of the day to comment on your, on your video, be it good or bad, you've made an impact on them at some point, so your art's worked. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and yeah, yeah, you should, you should take uh, all, nice. all, all the negativity as a compliment. It's it's yeah. your, your art's done it its purpose. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, being a sensitive person, it's hard though. It's hard. It's <laughs> hard to hard. do. <laughs> <laughs> I posted a, a thing of. Do you watch The Office, the American version of The I'm Office? Watching it at the moment, actually. Well, it's one of my favorite shows, and Michael has a little. Michael Scott has a clip about how he wants people to like them, like him. And it's, it's, you just, that's who I am. Like, do I want my art to make people feel something? Yes. Do I want them to feel liberated? Do I want, you know, curvy women to feel beautiful in their bodies? Like that's a big part of my art. Um, I grew up in the nineties with Pamela Anderson. Like it was not a good time for somebody who looks like me. I'm 4'11 and thicker than a snicker. It was not a good time for me. And, you know, I, I, 2019, like I kind of fell in love with who I was, good, bad, thick, whatever. Um, 
And so I wanted my art to reflect that too. Like that's the body positivity, which I'm glad that came up is some, something that's really just in reference. Just in reference to the, the the character that keeps reoccurring in the art. Now it's it is you that's obviously referenced within the art with with the pink hair, etc. Well. My explanation of the pink hair, do I use myself as references? Everybody asks me that. And sometimes yes. And I won't tell people which one's yes, which one's no. But sometimes I find a beautiful image and I make her body look like mine. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I not like mine because some of their bodies are more amazing than mine. But to resemble some kind of realness, somebody who is just comfortable with their body. Um, but the pink hair is really important to me because it was a big, it's something I wanted to do for years, but with my job, I didn't feel like I could and becoming like happy with myself. I was like, fuck it. I'm going to get pink hair. So even if the image isn't me, they're all a part of me. So I, I use the pink hair to kind of say that this is part of me, whether it is an image of me or not. So, yeah, so it's it's kind of that fuck it statement within yourself as a person with the art as well as a reflection to kind of just right. be like, yeah, look. And I'm not going to lie, a little of it is I want people to think it's me so that they're messaging and going, is this you? Like it, it kind of brings engagement up too. 100%. So there's a little bit yeah. of that marketing in the back of my head where I, I kind of know how men think sometimes. And if I if I make an image that looks like me, even if it, the image wasn't me, it might spark some more interest. So so one thing that's yeah, really yeah, yeah. sparked mine and Andy's interest, we've had a conversation about this before. Where did the skeleton come from? Matt Bailey. Do you know him? Right, I can't say I do. You're going to you're gonna have to elaborate. He's an amazing tattoo artist in London. Okay. And he, he says he's like a lover of big asses. Like that's his thing. And I, his images were so liberating and all of this, I found him on Instagram and I was like, you know, this is a man who obviously loves larger women, thick women, whatever. And I was just like the contrast of the skeleton and the thick woman. If you look at his work, I hope it doesn't come across like I stole. He he inspired me 100%. I will give that to him every day, but I have never looked at his image and gone, I'm going to recreate that. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, and also my husband is a thin, tall man. So the skeleton is kind of him in in an art form because um, he's 6'2 and very slim and I'm 4'11 and not. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm I'm, I'm sort of glad you've explained it because we we've been sort of wondering for probably a few weeks. We've been sort of batting forth ideas what, what the skeleton could represent. Yeah. And... and I think I think that's been a really sort of interesting part of looking at your art is kind of trying to work out. Well, it's it exactly it's in captivating to the point where you you start asking questions like, well, is it this? Is it because of this? You know, what's the reference to the skeleton? You start overplaying kind yeah. of so, different uh, kind of situations in your head to what it could reference. So you, you you're doing a good job in in kind of how you're portraying what you're doing. So and I love that. It's possibly loving someone even after they die kind of thought because I've been with my husband for 30 years. Like I don't really know a life without him. I was 16 when we met and like we've always been just Amy and Angel. We're like a unit. And the thought of having to, because I've had a lot of family members pass away, young, old, like 2013 was awful. I lost a lot of people. Um, so you, you, you are forced to think about life without the person you love. So that's a bit of it too. I did one where I was laying on his, on the skeleton's chest and that was absolutely me thinking about losing my husband someday. Wow. Right. Cool. Right. Well, look, we're going to kind of wrap this up a little bit. So, um, what does the future hold? Where do you, where do you see yourself? Have you got plans or are you kind of just riding it out and seeing where it takes you? I'm, I'm riding it out with the hope that I get more shows. Like that was such a great experience for me. Um, 
I, I need to join. A, see, I have a little bit of social anxiety, especially with COVID, where um, I don't want to go out that much anymore. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so finding something on social media where I can possibly do a show someday is definitely something I want to do. Um, but I haven't been actively going after that, and I probably need to. Um, where this reel gets me is kind of exciting to like to figure out like maybe the right person will see my art and it will lead to like a line of t-shirts or you know I would love to yeah, put yeah. my artwork on some clothes because I think a lot of men do love thicker women and would love to rock my stuff so that's definitely a plan it's just finding a company who can do it that won't censor me again yeah 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 and while cool. we're on the subject of it, do you want to shout your accounts out where anyone can find you on social medias? Sure. Um, I'm Amy Lopez 03762. It was my second account. Um, and the link in my bio is to my Etsy shop. Um, I am actively looking to add all my new artwork there. Um, it's just a matter of time. I have commissions to do, so look out for new artwork there. Um, and hopefully an apparel thing coming soon wicked so just final couple of questions yep. if you could meet your younger self what advice would you give yourself hmm you're good enough believe in yourself you're good yeah you're good enough Cool. And anybody that's watching that's an up and coming creative, um, and obviously they're going through the struggles with Instagram, et cetera, what advice would you give them? If it gets taken away, you can redo it again. So try not to censor yourself and do the art that you love. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, that's it. Amy, you've been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, um, and thanks good. so much for diving into, you know, a bit of your backstory and the mental health and everything like that. Um, it's greatly appreciated, and uh, thanks for coming on. That's Thank it. So Think this real blows you up in the next few days. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so that's it for now from myself and Mouse. Any updates for future episodes, make sure you rate and follow on Spotify or like and subscribe on YouTube. Also, you can find us on as Insta socials at WI Artist Mouse, Broken Thugs Club and Rogue Gallery Project. Um, so that's it. Till next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>